Hello Traveller, and welcome to another Invocation Academy review session for the upcoming version 4.3 patch. There is an incredible amount of new content featuring not only 11 new character cards, but also a bunch of new action cards, as well as some much needed balance changes. Like last time, I'll be saving characters for later videos once we've actually had a chance to play with the cards, so today we'll just be going over the balance changes and first impressions on the new cards. I say just, but it's a lot. You might have felt overwhelmed looking at all the new things on the preview page, so let me break things down for you and tell you which cards I think are worth experimenting with. But first, let's start with the easy stuff, balance changes. First up is a change to the Arcane Legend Joyous Celebration going down from 1 to 0 cost. This is a nice buff, and the second one Joyous has gotten recently, but even now I don't think this is worth playing. In the average case, it often cleanses about two elements, which if you listen to the TCG 101 on card evaluation you know to be equal to about two damage worth of value, which is roughly equivalent to one dice. So this doesn't quite compete with other more powerful and less situational Arcane Legends. Wind and Freedom or Mondstadt Residence got a much needed buff going down from 1 to 0 dice as well. After the rework, this card was barely any better than When the Crane Returns, which pretty much sees no play, but now at 0 dice is a lot closer to changing shifts with the potential for even more value, allowing you to cycle through your entire team in one round. I'm thinking Kaya, maybe? Definitely now a card you should at least consider and try. Stone and Contract or Liyue Resonance got a buff as well, drawing you a card at the start of the next round in addition to its normal effect. This did used to see some play, but we haven't seen it in a while since we now have a lot of other more powerful ramp options, but drawing a card means you're essentially getting free tuning and ramp just at a slight delay. I think combo decks in particular might be really interested in this now, as it's one of the best ways to carry over dice into the next turn. Great change, and I expect to see a lot more of these being played. Tamayas got a much needed buff, now drawing a random artifact from your deck provided you built it with at least 6. If you're playing Timaeus, you're almost certainly going to be running more than 6 artifacts anyway, so that's not really much of a restriction. The main problem with this card has always been drawing it with no artifacts in hand, but now that's not a problem. It's certainly a great upgrade, but decks that want to play artifacts tend to want to play them out as early as possible to start generating value and not have to wait a few rounds to recharge his stacks. Definitely something to experiment with, but not one that I think will actually be that impactful. Ragnar got a similar change during a weapon when played if you have at least three different weapon cards. While it sounds really similar to Timaeus, I like this change a lot more. You only need to commit three card slots to make this one work, rather than six. And weapons tend to be better when played later anyway, so it's more likely you're able to use Wagner more than once in a game. I'm actually really excited to play this in conjunction with some of the other weapon package cards like Fruit, Moonpiercer, and King Squire. And Dea got a minor change to now be tagged as an Eremite, just like Scorching Lawmaster, one of the new characters. We don't have any cards that care about this yet, but definitely hints that we might get an Eremite Residence card in the future, perhaps when another one is released. And finally, we reach the nerves, and first up is the one everyone is talking about, Oceanid. You can now only have two Mimics active at any time, which severely limits her effectiveness as it means you won't be able to reliably chain her 3 and 5 costs together. Along with the last nerf to her burst, this one is sure to take her out of the competitive meta for good. And it doesn't stop there, our beloved frog now only shields once instead of twice. While definitely a nerf, one interesting thing to note is that with this change you're actually a lot more likely to pop the frog immediately after summoning it, which ironically makes it more likely you can summon again through the two summon restriction. But that's not good enough of a reason to make up for the reduced effect, so overall this is a huge downgrade and we're not likely to see Oceanid for a while, but honestly, a much needed change as Oceanid has been dominating the meta since forever. Next, Pyro Agent now has 9 HP instead of 10. Since he started with stealth stacks, he was always effectively a 12 HP unit, so this seems pretty fair. Undeniably, he was one of the strongest third characters or anchors for any deck, so with this nerf, it should at least add some variety to decks and make you perhaps consider some other options. And last, very surprisingly, Ocean Hued Clam got a nerf despite only being just released, now only healing 2 HP instead of 3. This card started popping up a little bit in the same Agent Electro Charge deck dominating since the last update, which might explain this, but this change all but makes this card unplayable. At 2 HP, you no longer immediately get the damage buff without needing to rely on other healing, so this is a pretty big deal. Hopefully, we'll see this get a cost reduction later to 2 maybe to compensate, but for now, I definitely avoid this card. And that's it for the balance changes. Lots of good buffs to unplayed cards and a huge set of nerfs targeted specifically at the one Agent Electro Charge deck. Undeniably the best deck up until now. I think the timing is really great. Taking out the top dog of the metagame while introducing a bunch of new cards is really going to open up the variety of decks. And with the Agent Invitational coming up in about a month, I'm really excited to see what decks the competitive players decide to create. 
And speaking of new cards, let's take a look at them now. While we won't go into detail on these, the 11 new characters we're getting are Layla, Yilan, Linny, Lynette, Goro, al Hathame, Signora, Scorching Lawmaster, Thundering Manifestation, Dvalin, and Azdaha. In particular, I do want to highlight that Signora and Azdaha each have a unique mechanic that allows them to use other elements in their kit, similar to how Magu Kenki is an Anemo character with a Cryo skill. Definitely experiment with them on your own and see what you can come up with, but for now, let's go ahead and focus on the action cards. First up, we are getting five new weapons. Lost Prayer to the Sacred Winds is an interesting one as the first weapon that doesn't actually provide a damage bonus when equipped, but builds stacks at the end of the round up to a max of two. Unfortunately, having to wait two turns for a plus two bonus is simply too long, and this is already the baseline for a lot of other three cost weapons, so this looks pretty bad and there's much better catalyst you could be using. Tilaytilo's Remembrance adds plus one damage and reduces the cost to use a charged attack by one underlying die up to twice around. This one actually seems quite good for any catalysts that like to use charged attacks like Klee or Wanderer. Stringing it twice in a turn makes it effectively cost one and it even helps you keep your even dice count for more charged attacks. Beacon of the Reed C adds plus one damage and adds another damage for the round after using a skill and or after taking damage. If both happen in a round, you're effectively getting plus 3 damage in that round, but since the effect is limited to once a round and requires you to use a skill, it's pretty hard to consistently get the full bonus. It has some potential, but typically only combo decks care for raw damage like this, and most of those decks might just prefer to use Wolf's Gravestone, so not expecting to see much of this. Primordial Jade Wing Spear, on the other hand, is the opposite, getting plus one damage and then each time you use a skill increases this bonus by plus one up to two dimes, capping also at plus three damage until the end of the round. Now this is the kind of card that Combo wants and seems tailor-made for that Shao OTK deck. Moon Piercer might still be the more consistent option with its dice discount, but I could definitely see this being used maybe as a secondary weapon to have some more explosive one-turn kill turns. Still, this is one to keep an eye on. And lastly, Light of Folio Incision adds plus one damage and generates a random die after using a normal attack up to twice around. This is really similar to two light tulas and seems really good for any sword user focused around normal attacks like Ayaka, for example. It doesn't require charged attacks either, so it's a little bit more flexible and seems like another great combo deck enabler and I imagine we'll be seeing this one a fair bit. And next up, we also have five new artifacts. Gilded Dreams is the expensive version of Shadow of the Sand King from the last version, drawing you one card whenever the character triggers an elemental reaction up to twice around. The on-play effect, however, is different and doesn't draw you a card right away, but instead adds one die of the same element of your character than an Omni die if you have a rainbow team, meaning three different elements. Okay, first off, you should only run this card in a rainbow deck, otherwise it's certainly not worth it. One way to think about this in that deck is it's kind of like a Liban, spending three dice to fix two of your dice and drawing cards, but unlike its smaller counterpart, it's a lot harder to reliably get two cards off of this since it doesn't draw you a card on play, which probably means it's not very good. Flowing Rings is our first zero cost artifact and once around draws a card when you use a normal attack. Don't ever underestimate zero cost cards that can draw a card right away. These tend to be the best cards in a lot of other TCGs and this one is no exception. Provided your deck wants to normal attack already at some time, this at the minimum replaces itself right away with zero cost and with the possibility of drawing more cards later. Add to that the synergy with other artifact cards like Ancient Courtyard or Yayoi and while the effect sounds really small, the flexibility of this card should not be underestimated and I expect this to see a lot of play. Echoes of an Offering is its expensive counterpart costing two and also drawing a card off a normal attack. Additionally, it generates a die anytime you use a skill, normal attack included provided your current dice count is less than or equal to the number of cards in your hand. Similar to Sumeru City's effect. Even though it has the same card draw effect as its cheaper version, I like this way less than the zero cost. While it sounds similar to Sumeru City, the fact that it's tied to a single character and doesn't affect your whole team is a much bigger limitation and I definitely avoid this one. Heart of Kavarina's Brilliance is another zero cost artifact that draws a card once around, but this time when you take damage. This is even better than Flowing Rings as taking damage is even less conditional than normal attacks and it has all the same benefits of being zero cost card that replaces itself. Your opponent does have some choice in playing around this, but what are they gonna do, not deal damage to you? You can easily equip this to on any character that's going to take summon damage at the end of the turn to guarantee the draw. I think we'll be seeing a lot of this card, uh, that is if it wasn't for the next card we're gonna look at, Vorukash's Glow. This has the same card draw effect when taking damage, but also heals the character for one HP at the end of the round for one dice. Infinite Mushroom Pizzas, anyone? This card looks insane. While it is one more cost than its counterpart, the healing effect is well worth it and synergizes perfectly as it keeps the character alive longer to take more hits to draw more cards. 
Since the heal also can happen off field, it's almost trivial to get two points worth of healing over this over the two rounds. And if you get that character hit twice, well, you've basically just played a strategize plus a hash round for one dice with the opportunity for even more later. The sheer value on this card is incredible and I'm willing to bet a lot of decks are gonna start using this, if not every deck. Definitely a highlight of this patch and one to watch out for. Onto event cards, starting with a new Arcane Legend, Passing of Judgment. For one die, the next three event cards your opponent plays have no effect. Yep, that's right, Genius Invocation finally got a counter spell. There are a lot of important event cards in the game, things like Woven, Food I Haven't Lost Yet, Quick Swaps, Card Draw, just to name a few. Timing this well in a game could be really backbreaking, particularly against combo decks that love to play a ton of these cards in a single round. But don't get too excited just yet. Keep in mind your opponent knows this is in play and is able to play around it, which makes this a little bit worse than it looks. If you go second as well, your opponent might also be able to play some of the event cards first before you get a chance to use this. Not only that, there are a lot of event cards that are zero cost, which could allow your opponent to easily use up the effect for no dice and then continue playing action cards after that. The best way to think about this card is it's kind of like a reverse card draw spell. For one dice, you trade one of your cards for three of your opponents and probably on average one dice worth of value, which sounds good, but the bar on arcane cards are really high. For example, you'll most often play this on round three as that's when it's most impactful, but on that turn, you could play Stove God for three cards as well, but for zero dice cost. Also, giving your opponents a choice almost always makes a card worse than it actually looks. So there's definitely gonna be times when this card is going to be insane, and I'm sure we'll see a lot of those clips end up on YouTube highlights, but for me, this has all the trappings of a card that looks a lot better than it actually plays. So I'm excited that it exists and I'm excited to try it out, but I'm a little bit skeptical of how good it will be. Still though, it seems like a ton of fun. The Boar Princess grants an Omni die whenever you discard an equipment for any reason, which is either a character dying or you replacing it up to two times. This is super conditional and being an event card means you can't even save this effect across multiple rounds. It's cute, but unfortunately not a good card. Falls and Fortune causes both players to spend an extra die when switching characters, and you can only play it if your opponent has eight dice and has not ended their turn, which essentially means at the start of the turn. Keep in mind, this effect is symmetrical and affects you as well. And not only that, if your opponent does go first, you sometimes can't even play it. It has some potential with some characters with prepare skills like Cube or Dvalin, but honestly not worth including. Flickering Four Leaf Sigil is a really cool card that is played on a character and for the rest of the game, you'll switch to that character at the end of every round. This actually might have some niche applications in combo decks that want to safely build up a key character but not leave them exposed at the end of the round, always allowing you to safely switch onto a different character. And this also seems great in combination with Vorukasha artifacts we saw before. Definitely a niche effect but can't be powerful in the right situation, so looking forward to see if anyone can cook something up with this. And for our final event card, Fish and Chips, which causes all characters' elemental skills to cost one less for the round. If you can actually use three character skills in one round, this does generate an additional die, which is pretty nice. And this is perfect in combination with the improved Mondstadt Resonance. If you play both in a round, it perfectly adds up to eight dice to use three skills across your whole team, which is a really potent combination. And I expect to see those two cards play together quite a lot. And last up, we have the support cards, starting with two new locations. Weeping Willow of the Lake draws two cards at the end of your round, but only if your hand has no more than two cards, and this happens twice. While the restriction is significant, the efficiency is huge. Drawing four cards for just one die, you can compare it to Liyue Wharf trading that one die cost for some reduced flexibility. But any deck that likes to make aggressive plays in that first round are really going to love this card. I can see a lot of potential here in the right decks. Really excited to start playing around with this one. Opera Epicles is pretty wordy, but essentially at the start of your round, if the weapons and artifacts on your side collectively cost more than what your opponents have, you get a die up to three times. In order to make this really consistent, you're going to need a lot of both weapons and artifacts. Otherwise, you might just run into situations where this does nothing because you didn't draw enough equipments or your opponent happens to draw more equipments than you did. The effect also isn't super powerful being only once around, so there's a lot better ways to generate dice and in general, I'd avoid this card. Mamiya is an extremely interesting card. Once around, when you play food, location, companion, or an item action, she will randomly create a card of one of these types in your hand, up to three times. Unlike some of the other effects you're used to, this one doesn't draw an existing card from your deck, but creates a completely new one from all the possible cards out there. While the generated card is random, playing it does mean next round you will guarantee that you create another card, so it does fuel itself, which is pretty nice. 
But there are a lot of cards it can potentially create, some of them pretty bad and some of them very situational. But three cards for zero dice is still a lot of value and will work pretty nicely with cards like Sumeru City that just care about your number of cards in hand. Another way to think about this is after drawing two cards, you've kind of played a bestest companion as you can always use those two cards to tune and fix two dice. Overall, this is really interesting and pretty hard to evaluate until we start playing with it, so definitely give it a try. And speaking of item action cards, we have two new ones. Seed Dispensary will discount a one cost support card by one, effectively making it cost zero. This could be powerful as it has the potential to generate two dice and has a lot of similarity with Dunyazad as a lot of those cards are companions. However, since it doesn't draw you those companions when you play it, in general this does look worse than Dunyazan and you should probably not play it. Though if you find your deck with a lot of 1 costs, then maybe give it a try. And lastly, Memento Lens discounts a weapon, artifact, location, or companion by 2 if you've already played a card of the same name this game. The fact that it works off of you simply playing it rather than requiring it to be on field does mean you can probably pretty reliably trigger this at least once a game. However, if you look at the average deck, most of your cards end up being event cards, which this doesn't affect, and we already have similar cards that provide more consistent discounts for a single type like Tubby or Dunyazan. This might have some potential in a deck that can consistently draw most of its cards but overall doesn't look particularly great. Ooh, and we made it. That wraps up all the new cards. As you can see, there are a ton of them, which means there's a ton of new ways to build your decks. In case you missed some of the details, here's a recap of ones I think will be the most impactful in the new version. From weapons, to Lightula's Remembrance, Jade Spear, and Foliant Incisions. From artifacts, we have Flowing Rings and both versions of Vorukasha's Glow. And finally, for event and support cards, Fish and Chips, Weeping Willow, and Mimir. But keep in mind, these are just my impressions and we're really not going to be able to tell until we start playing with these cards just which ones are really good. Still, hopefully this review session has given you a bit of an easier time wrapping your head around the new cards and hopefully sparked a few ideas for decks you might want to try yourself. I'm definitely looking forward to the brave new Genius Invocation metagame we're about to step into and I hope you are too. If you are a newer player, be sure to attend the TCG 101 series to level up your Genius Invocation game. If there's anything you'd like to see in an upcoming video, drop a comment and I'll see how I can help. Be sure to enroll in our courses by subscribing so you can be notified when a new lesson's available. Until then, class dismissed!